Hello everyone, today we'll be talking about injection of labor. So basically when we talk about the word injection, that means beginning the process, right? So beginning the process of labor. So induction of labor refers to initiation of uterine contractions after the period of viability by any method, medical, surgical, or combined for the purpose of vaginal delivery. When say injection, we said induction is starting something, right? So initiation of what? Uterine contractions. So you need to take note that it is after the period of fetal viability. So viability of the fetus. So this is variable. Most of the countries 24 weeks, other countries use 28 weeks, and the very developed countries can also use 20 weeks, okay, by any method. So the method can be medical, surgical, or combined for the purpose of vaginal delivery. Then a similar term to injection of labor is augmentation of labor. So this is the process of stimulation of uterine contractions, which is both in frequency and intensity that are already present, but found to be inadequate. So can we differentiate induction of labor with augmentation of labor? So when we say injection is initiation of contractions, okay, so the contractions have not yet started, we want to start the contraction. And augmentation is the contractions are already present, but they're inadequate, okay? So what is the purpose of injection of labor? So this is basically when the risk of continuation of pregnancy either to the mother or to the fetus is more injection is indicated. So what kind of risk can there be to the mother such as intrauterine fetal death and risk to the fetus such as post maturity, okay? So what are the indications of injection of labor? So we've got preeclampsia, eclampsia. So this falls under hepatitis disorders in pregnancy. If you please a video that I've made on this topic, you can go through it. Then we have maternal medical complications such as diabetes mellitus, renal disease, cholestasis of pregnancy, post maturity, abruptio placenta, intrauterine growth, growth restriction, recess ice immunization, premature rupture of membranes, fetus with a major congenital anomaly, intrauterine death of the fetus. Oligohydramnios, polyhydramnios, unstable lie after correction into longitudinal lie. Then, what are the contraindications of injection of labor? That is, if there is a contracted pelvis or if there is cephalopelvic pelvic disproportion, if there is malpresentation, such as bridge, transverse, oblique lie, if there is a history of previous classical cesarean section or hysterotomy. Uteroplacental factors such as unexplained vaginal bleeding, basa previa, placenta previa. Then active genital herpes infection, high risk pregnancy with fetal compromise such as heart disease, pelvic tumor. Then elderly premigravida with obstetric or medical complications, umbilical cord prolapse, cervical carcinoma. So here we talked about common indications. So we talked about a lot of indications, but what are the common indications for induction of labor? This include post-maturity, intrauterine fetal death, congenital malformations of the fetus, preeclampsia or eclampsia, antipartum hemorrhage include abruptio placenta, chronic, hy chronic hydramnios. Then what are the dangers or risks associated with induction of labor? So maternal includes psychological upset when there's injection failure and cesarean incident. So one thing you need to know is the chances of failure of injection of labor. And once there's failure of injection of labor, you need to proceed to cesarean section. So that can lead to psychological upset, right, of the mother. The tendency of prolonged labor due to abnormal uterine contractions. Then increased need of analgesia during labor, increased operative interference, and increased morbidity. Then what are the fetal risks such as iatrogenic prematurity, which is maybe you thought that the fetus has reached term when the fetus is not term. So that can be iatrogenic prematurity, hypoxia due to uterine dysfunction, prolonged labor, operative interference. Then parameters to assess prior to induction of labor. So when you're thinking of induction of labor, there's some parameters that you need to assess, okay? So you need to ensure the gestational age and maturity. That is pulmonary maturity of the fetus. However, sometimes if you're doing injection for maternal reasons, then you may ignore the fetus, which is the gestation age and maturity, because the mother's life is at risk. 
So what are the parameters that are to, to assess prior to injection of labor? So maternal, to confirm the indication of injection of labor, exclude the contraindication, we assess the bishop's score, score should be above six, that is favorable. So we're also going to discuss the bishop's score. Perform clinical pulmonary to assess pelvic adequacy, adequate counseling about the risks, benefits, and alternatives of injection of labor with the woman and the family members. Then fetal include, you need to ensure the fetal gestational age is term to estimate fetal weight. So clinically and using the ultrasonogram, ensure fetal lung maturation status, ensure fetal presentation and lie, and confirm fetal well-being. So what are the factors that are assessed for successful injection of labor, the period of gestation? So if the pregnancy is near the term or post-term, the more the success. Pre-injection bishop scores. If bishop score is above six, that's favorable. And dilatation of the cervix is the most important factor. Then sensitivity of the uterus, so you can do oxy oxytocin sensitivity test. If it's positive, that is favorable. Then cervical ripening. It's favorable in parasimon and in cases with premature rupture of membrane. Then presence of fetal fibronectin, which is favorable for successful injection of labor and the case profile. So a low bishop score, which is less than or equal to five is unripe. And it points towards the unfavorable cervix. So remember we talked about cervical ripening earlier. So what is that? So cervical ripening is a series of complex biochemical changes in the cervix, which is mediated by the hormones. So this is where there is alteration of both cervical, collagen, and ground substance. Ultimately, the cervix becomes soft and pliable. So cervical ripening basically refers to the cervix becoming soft and pliable. So what are the methods of cervical ripening? So we've got pharmacological methods and non-pharmacological methods. So pharmacological methods include administration of prostaglandins such as dinoprostone in, in form of a gel, tablet, or suppository, misoprostol, which can be in the form of a tablet, then oxytocin, then progesterone receptor antagonists such as mifepristone, then relaxin, hyaluronic acid, estrogen. Then we've got non-pharmacological methods, which include scribbling the membranes, amniotomy, which we also refer to as artificial rupture of the membranes, mechanical dilators, osmotic dilators, and transcervical balloon catheter. So now this is the Bishop score. This is referred to as the Bishop's pre-induction cervical scoring system. This is the modified one. So under the cervix, we've got dilatation, cervical effacement, consistency, position, of position and the head, okay? Then cervical length. Then the modification that we talked about, so this replaces effacement percentage with cervical length in centimeters. So this was the modification. When talk about dilatation, if it's close, that points to zero points. If it's one to two, that's one point. If it's three to four centimeters, that's two points. And five plus is three points. Then investment percentage, 0 to 30% is 0.40 to 50% is 1 point, 60 to 70% is 2 points, and greater than 80% is 3 points. Then consistency firm is 0 point, medium is 1 point, soft is 2 points. Then position, posterior stands for 0 points, midline stands for 1 point, anterior for 2 points. Then station of the fetal head, if it's negative three, that's zero. If it's negative two, that's one. If it's negative one or zero, it stands for a score of two. And if it's positive one or positive two, that gives a score of three. So total score 13, favorable score is six to 13, and unfavorable score is five or less than five. Then the modification that we talked about was cervical left in place of cervical effacement. So length, if it's greater than four centimeters, then that gives us zero points. Two to four centimeters, that gives us one point. One to two centimeters gives us two points and less than one centimeter gives us two points. So methods of injection of labor and the common clinical conditions. So medical methods are usually used in when there's intrauterine fetal death, premature rupture of membranes, and in combination with surgical injection, which is artificial rupture of membranes. Then surgical methods are commonly used for rupture placenta, chronic hydramnio, severe preeclampsia, eclampsia, in combination with medical injection. Then combined method, this is done to shorten the injection delivery interval in its common leader. 
So that is you start with the medical method and then later fully by surgical method, okay? So remember we talked about oxytocin and prostaglandin under the medical injection methods. So what are the advantages of using each? When do we use oxytocin? When do we use prostaglandin? So the cost, oxytocin is cheaper. Prostaglandins are relatively expensive. Then stability, oxytocin needs refrigeration. And prostaglandin A2 needs refrigeration. However, prostaglandin E1 is stable at room temperature. Then administration oxytocin is given by IV infusion. Prostaglandins are given by intravaginally orally. Effectiveness oxytocin, effectiveness is less with low Bishop score if it's IUFT or less a week of pregnancy. Prostaglandins are more effective in those cases as it has got more collagenolytic properties and it also sensitizes the myometrium to oxytocin. Then side effects of oxytocin include uterine hyperstimulation, which is common with high doses. And once you stop the infusion, the hyperstimulation ceases. Then prostaglandins, so if you give it as a low dose, then it has minimal side effects. However, tachycystal, it may last longer. Then systemic side effects include, so oxytocin has less systemic side effects. Like, however, it can lead to water intoxication. That is because it has structure similar to ADH. Then prostaglandin systemic side effects may be troublesome, especially with oral or IV infusion. However, vaginal root has got minimal side effects. Antidiuretic effect that is in high doses and prostaglandin has no antidiuretic effect. So that's all about induction of labor. If you have any questions, feel free to comment. If you like the video, please like, subscribe and comment. Thank you.